Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. And uh, welcome back as usual. It's always good to see you. Uh, today, as you see here, we begin a new chapter and a new era. And as we have done this so many times, every time we begin a new era, a new uh, chapter, we speak about the features, the characteristics. Last time I said, these features are not like black and white where we have them all the time or we don't have them all, all the time. These features characterize the most common literary works or we can find most of them or some of them in the majority of, of works because there will always be authors and writers and poets and dramatists who would change, experiment. We, for example, uh, studied John Donne, who was writing in the heyday of neoclassicism, and he was writing totally uh, different poetry. So if the writer, the author, is a product of his or her society and community, which is generally true, sometimes we have poets who are different, who just try to swim against the current, swim against the current. Today we speak about the Augustan age. The Augustan age is one of the most famous uh, ages here because we have things that are clearer than than ever before. In this age, we'll mainly speak about uh, the novel, which is prose, right? Yes. And we will also speak about poetry. But for the first time, we're going to start talking about not poetry, but prose. The novel, the word novel, this is sometimes called the age of the novel, the rise of the novel. The word novel means new. new. This is a novel say idea. a novel idea. Mm -hmm. And even in English, we, have, we say the word novice. When someone starts a new job, he or she doesn't have enough experience, you say she's novice. In Arabic, in Gaza sometimes, we hear people say novi, jdeed novi. The word originally comes from novel. The word novella is a short novel. So what is a novel? A novel is? A fiction work written in prose. in prose. It was born around, like in the late 17th century, early 19th century. And that's why it's called novel. It started only 300 years ago. Unlike poetry that started thousands of years ago, even thousands and thousands of years ago. OK? So the Augustan age, we'll speak later on. When we speak about poetry, we'll talk more about why we have this name, the Augustan age in literature. It is sometimes described as the age of reason, the age of thinking, where the mind, the brain, the intellect was considered to be more powerful, more important, more significant for the stability of the community than the heart, the emotions, and, and the feelings. We'll see how this reflects on uh, literature in, in a way or another. So the age starts around. Again, these dates are not, again, clear cut. But more or less, th around th uh, 1713 to 1789. So from the, the, tw the uh, beginning first of the first half, the first quarter of the 18th century to the late and, uh, 18th century. So yeah, same, same, same uh, century, 18th century. OK. <laughs> When we speak about politics, about the community, about the society, we generally speak about a king, right? Yeah. A queen, a politics. And we also said this before, that sometimes the book hides white and white washes colonialism and imperialism and presents it in a favorable way, okay? as a glory, as geographical discovery. Remember previously, in the previous age, the king was executed, was removed, and was replaced by Oliver Cromwell, the Commonwealth. And he was followed by his son. I have said this many times, and I have to say it again. And then they said, OK, let's bring back the king, because the king is important. But the king started to lose a lot. The monarchy started to lose a lot. The king or the queen lost a lot of their power, their privileges. And if the king was getting weaker and weaker, it means the parliament, the prime minister, the government, the cabinet became stronger and stronger. Like today, the monarchy in England is symbolic. It started gradually. 
The queen is not the most important person. People love the queen, although she spends a lot, wastes a lot of tax uh, payer money. Many people are not happy with this, but some people like the idea of the queen. Okay, so this is uh, uh, one thing. Every time the monarchy loses power, the parliament gains more of this power and, and privileges. Generally, when we speak about this age, the 18th century, we speak about the agricultural and the industrial revolutions. There was a revolution in uh, like advancements, inventions. Uh, people uh, invented so many things. And every day, every week, every month, there would be new inventions that made life easy, that most importantly made the, uh, the production, the processes of production faster, cheaper, and easier. And always remember the printing press. Printing press. Yes. The printing press, you would spend two years to copy the Bible, one copy of the Bible. But now, because of this, you could do 200 copies in, I don't know, less than a year or something. So same, same thing applies to the steam machine, the engine, and later on the train. So people would move on horses and animals. It would take them ages and ages. But now, things became easier, faster, and probably Cheap. better. And because of this, or maybe as a result of this, sometimes you can't know which leads to which, which came first, the egg or the chicken, the hen. <laughs> but it's a circuit. Always remember that England, the British Empire, was expanding. So was it expanding because England wanted more raw materials to control more land? and also to open more markets. So they would do a lot, like most of the production here would be sold in the new world, in uh, Asia, Africa, America, Australia, here and there. So the new uh, uh, discovery, the new inventions, again, meant that production was faster, better, and easier in many ways. OK, you have a lot of products. What should you do with them? You take them and sell them to Others. the colonies. You sell them to the colonies. So the British Empire was ready, was a ready market. You had uh, here four British products. So whatever you produce, you just dump it on the people in India, in Africa, in America and Australia, and they would be buying it. And it, mean, it meant that a lot of people were getting rich by doing business. And that was a reason why we have the middle class. We spoke about the middle class before. Generally, they're not rich people. They're not royalty. They don't have a uh, you know, noble family that would leave a lot of money and inheritance for them. So those are people who engaged in trade, in business, in inventions. And they became uh, uh, rich, and they played an important role in, in literature. Many people in this uh, era here moved from the village, the countryside, to the city, seeking jobs, seeking better life chances, better life opportunities. And at the same time, during this age, many people from the, the, the British Empire, like mainly from uh, Scotland and Ireland, moved to the new world in America. Many reasons, actually. Life was very difficult. When we speak about England or Britain and, and, and uh, Ireland and Scotland, sometimes we need to go back to the history to understand. Because a lot of Irish people consider England as Occupy. an occupier, a colonizer, so an occupation. Well, maybe we can talk about this later on when we speak about uh, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Swift. So because of the, and don't forget that many of the Irish people were Catholics. So they did not convert after King Henry VIII. So they were always uh, 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 victimized by, by the English people. More of this age. Elsewhere in the world, so England was seeking stability. England was trying to, you know, like uh, Theresa May says nowadays, to be strong and stable. Strong and stable means many things. Uh, but most importantly here, around the age, around England, we had important revolutions. Number one, the French Revolution. 
in France. And France is only across, uh, across the canal. You can't see France. Some people swim from France to, to England. Just take it swimming because it's, not a, a, it's a big distance, but not that big that some people can't sw actually swim it. So France was always a threat because a revolution, a rebellion in France means that people in England might also think of a revolution against oppression, against corruption. But England has learned the lesson pretty well when they executed the king and replaced uh, him, and then later on they restored the king. And so they were always careful about you know, not to be infected by, so to speak, by another revolution. And probably equally important, so the, the, we speak about also the American Declaration of Independence. Uh, America was mainly a British uh, colony. Yeah. Yeah. It was occupied, so to speak, controlled by the Queen of England or the King of England, the monarchy. It followed the British Empire in many ways, great parts of it. Some parts in, in America even now are called New England. There is a, is, is it a state? I think it's a, it's a state in, in England, in, in, in America called New England. <coughs> yeah. So even the names, there are you know, names after London and everything else. So the Declaration of Independence, the defeat of the British uh, armies, meant that America was independent. And also, we have a very, very important date here, which is the French Revolution. We're not speaking, we're not studying French literature, so we're not going to talk much here. But one of the most interesting topics in modern history is this French Revolution. If you're not interested in history, maybe you want to, do, to read Le Miserable by, by Victor Hugo. Al Boasa, you know? Yes. Yeah. Um, a real interesting uh, read. It's huge, it's big. Maybe you can watch a movie. It was turned into a musical like three years ago or four yeah. years ago. Beautiful, not the, the, mis the, miserable. the Miserable. Yeah, The Miserable. Anyway, so the most important thing about the French Revolution is that it gave rights to the individual. It tried to destroy the idea of the monarchy being, you know, the king and the queen being the most powerful man in the society. The man, the individual, the person became the most important uh, person in the society. And that's why they called for three things, very important to know. Liberty, equality, and fraternity. Liberty, hurriya, equality, adala, fraternity, al ukhwa We are all equal and brothers and free. Man was born free. Man was born free. How did England feel about this? It took this as a threat to its stability. A threat to its stability. OK, most importantly, so there was, again, political turmoil around. England was trying to be stable and secure and safe to avoid another revolution. Uh, literature, in general, followed the, the rules of decorum, especially in poetry. But the most significant thing we speak here about is the rise of the novel. Many things led to the rise of the novel. Number one, remember we spoke about the closure of the theater because the drama was dying out. And we spoke about the, middle, the rise of the middle class. We also speak about here journalism. But one of the most significant things here is that writing became a profession and a, and, and, uh, and a significant job. When, it mean, when I say it's a job, it means it's a paying job. In the past, you had to have a patron, some rich guy, a royalty who would provide you with pro uh, protection, financial aid, money, so you would write poetry or, or something. Sometimes you have to write good things about them because People did not publish their work. So you would write poetry, but you don't have money. So how would you live? You need food, right? You need a job. Now it became a job, thanks to the rise of journalism. And okay, of, of course, uh, the uh, publishing houses were everywhere. So a writer, if, if a publishing house would know that Sabah, for example, is, is a writer, they would, uh, uh, Sabah, what do you think? Would you write for us regularly every day or every week? Or sometimes, would you publish a novel in our newspaper where you publish, for example, two or three chapters every, every week or something? So, who's that? 
how much are you paying? We're paying you this amount of money. Oh, good. It's enough for me to live a good life sometimes. Like a life of a rich person. So even if you don't want to write, because it's a job you have to write. This could be negative sometimes because you have to write a lot to make more money, especially if you write, uh, you, you pay per, per word. But generally, we have had a lot of literary works thanks to journalism. And the rise of the middle class is significant. I told you this before because the middle class are originally not rich people who become rich, who want to show off their riches. This is not to insult the, the middle classes. But they played a significant role because they would read the magazines, the newspapers, the novels, the essays, the pamphlets, the articles. And they would send their kids to school. They would have their own libraries at home. So they show that they are, yeah, they're not, uh, you know, royalty. They're not rich, very rich people, but they are educated. educated in addition to the fact that they have some money, a good source of, uh, of income. So important features of this age, number one, Writing became a profession, a paying job. So you don't have to depend on someone to control you, to tell you what to, to, to write, what not to write, to censor you. But that, does that mean total independence? Does it mean the writer is totally independent and free? Does it mean now you have no one paying you money to write stuff? You're just writing for a newspaper. Does it give you total freedom? Yes. yes or no? Maybe there's always the government that you want to be careful not to attack openly and you know yeah. criticize, satirize openly. You could write freely, freely, not following the rules of the Quran. You could, like you have, you have your own identity, like you don't have to follow particular people's attitudes and ideologies. You have to write what people like. And oh, interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Hayek. Yes, you get independence, but when you want to write, you want to please your readers. Many people, when you ask people who write, I'm not sure if, if some of you write stuff, poetry mainly, or fiction. When you ask people, why do you write? They will tell you to communicate with people, to reach out to people, right? Yes. But some people say, no, I write for myself. Yes. To release something inside. I don't care about people, I don't care about readers. I want to express myself. Whether you do it for this or that, if you work for a publisher, you need to please the publisher. And you also need to please the readers, the readers themselves. Interesting dynamic we have here. OK? So the rise of uh, the, the novel was mainly due to uh, the rise of journalism and magazines and publishing houses. And also, uh, writing itself became a, a paying job. The rise of the middle uh, classes was also significant to the rise of the novel to this new genre, genre in, in literature. Don't forget that women, so far have we ever mentioned a woman poet or a writer or playwright? No. Can you imagine that? That's crazy. It's like a thousand years in English literature. I'm sure there was a woman here or there, but so far... We haven't mentioned any woman at all. Hmm. Why is that? Are women, women unable to write like men? Are they less intellectual? Are they not smart? Why, can't, why don't we have women who write poetry or drama? Please. Because people who were, were in charge that time were anti-feminist. There was a lot of anti-feminism in the society. And anti-feminism means Belie the belief that women are not as smart, as intellectual. They come up, are they going to write about? Kitchen stuff, diapers, babies, food, cooking? It's not interesting. So there was a lot of this looking down upon women, anti-feminism. What else? Maybe they were excluded because of rules of the Quran. Because? So okay. what do you mean exactly? They, they wrote, but nobody read them. Or okay, interesting. So maybe they wrote stuff, but the critics of that time and the publishers, like, would you publish this? My daughter wrote this. Your daughter? I don't publish for women. It could have happened. Even nowadays, sometimes it happens. I don't want to publish for a woman. Who wants to read stuff by maybe some a woman? Were written by a woman? Interesting idea. So we don't know. 
and we'll see later on when we speak about the Victorian age, one of the most important female writers in the Victorian age is named George Eliot. George, a woman, there is T.S. Eliot, but that's some, somebody else. George Eliot, come on, a woman, yes. She's a woman who changed, who used a pen name or a pseudonym in order to be published to reach out to more people. You will be surprised. You know J.K. Rowling already, right? Yeah. yeah. J.K. Rowling, the author of? Harry Potter. Harry Potter. When she had trouble finding a publisher. Now, according to many, I, I, actually I read this like 10 years ago. She was richer than the queen. I read something like 15 years ago that says every letter she wrote, every letter, from every letter she made more than $300. She was yeah, but she was very poor. According to many resources, she's now richer than the queen. She said, no, this is an exaggeration. But she became, it's not about becoming, becoming like very rich. It's about becoming famous and writing and reaching out to millions and millions of people. Her books were translated into, I think, I think 100 languages. No, more. And the movies and everything. J.K. Rowling had trouble finding a publisher. I think one reason is that because she's a woman. Even in the 20th century, 21st century. And you will be surprised to know that this is one reason why we don't have her full name on the cover. When she was accepted, I think the publisher was like, listen, can we not use your first name so the readers don't know you are a woman and would pick the book, assuming that the, the author is a man? And they have this compromise where she would write her name as J.K. J. K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling. Yani Juan, Sharif K. Ish, Azub Khamis, Yani Juan Khamis Rowling or something. I'm not sure. But that's in the 20th century. Isn't that interesting? So women have always been victimized, discriminated against. Now, we have the first ever female author in our course. We have women as, remember at the beginning they were objects of sex and desire and perfection. Later on they were more independent. More, in a way they're getting more independent, right? Yes. We've seen Shakespeare. Sometimes we have the weak woman. Sometimes the powerful, strong woman like Portia, for example. Now we have Afra Ben. Afra Ben, she's actually, by the way, look, she's not an Augustan figure, but we pushed he, her here because we're right, talking about the novel now. So she's a novelist. She wrote drama, by the way. She wrote a lot. She wrote, she wrote like 30 uh, uh, novels. But many people say that, no, the real, the father of the novel is, Robin, uh, is Daniel Defoe, is a man. She was ignored, in my opinion, mainly because she was a woman and mainly because the critics, you know critics, what critics? Yeah. Critics, Nukad, literary critics, were all, almost all of them, I think all of them were male. So they neglected her. Afra Bin is a significant figure in our course. What's her name? Afra Bin. You should know the name, Afra Bin. And it, it's very interesting, not sure if we, if we mentioned Virginia Woolf before. Virginia. Did we mention Virginia Woolf? No. Virginia Woolf is a 20th century uh, critic, feminist, and author. What's feminist again? Feminist? Women are money. Feminine, you know feminine? Yes. Related to women. Feminist, I-S-T here, is a person, usually a woman, Support. sometimes could Support. be a man, the who struggles for the rights of women supports, struggles, fights for the equal rights of women. Remember what T.S. Eliot did to John Donne? In a he, way, he she did the same to Afra Ben. And by the way, she was one of the people who praised John Donne. Remember, like many people were like saying, oh, John Donne is, a, is an anti-feminist. She was like, no. The women in John Donne are powerful, are strong, and uh, independent. So. This is an interesting piece of information to know. Women have always written fiction. Why? Why is that? Why is, is this the case? Why would women living in an oppressive society, a society that 
is mistreating them, is considering them second class citizens, would be writing a lot of fiction. Why would fiction be their resort? Can you guess? This is the, the way out of the, the real. Amazing answer. This is a way out of an oppressive society. Out of the real life into... They're trying to create a, to new, create world. a new world of their own. There is escapism here. They escape to a world, a world of their own creation, not the creation of men. What else? I guess they are more sensitive. Interesting idea, uh, but uh, I'm not sure how would you take this. But I take it in the positive sense that women have are more emotional, more able to express emotions than men. It's a, it's a matter of discussion, but possible. Yeah. What else? I write about what? New things. Like what? Like fairy tales or something. Only fairy tales? Do women always only write about fairy tales? No. Write about the struggle. They can write. They can symbolize their case. Exactly. They can defend themselves in fiction. They can resist the patriarchy, the man-made rules. They can reject this. Meaning. So writing is also an act of resistance. Like us Palestinians, when we write literature, when we write journalism sometimes, we express ourselves. We reach out to the people. We resist a, an oppressive occupier that is killing us day and night. So that could be uh, some... Yeah, please. Maybe they don't want the writings to be about... Uh, the theme of the writing to be about men, only about men. About men. We'll see this, yeah. We'll have, we'll have more women now than, than ever before. Okay? Uh, don't f forget, women were the greatest part of the readership. Okay? Now, Afra Ben wrote several uh, books, like I just said. We're going just to mention two and discuss one of them. The first one is called Love Letters Between a Nobleman and His Sister, or Love Letters, in short. Love Letters Between a Gentleman, a Noble Gentleman, and his sister, a noble man and his sister. Now, as the name suggests, actually, sorry, it's uh, love letters, plural. As the name suggests, the whole novel is based on an exchange of letters. And the word letter means risala or, sorry, epistle. Do you know this word? With a silent T, like castle like whistle, like whistle. Epistle means letter. Letter. And from this, we have the famous uh, uh, word, it's epistolary. In this regard here, we say the ta. We pronounce the ta sound. It's epistle, epistolary novel. This is important. What is an epistolary novel? Please. It's a book that has. Uh, Don't read. Uh, it's a book that has uh, letters exchanged between a person and the other. Very good. The plot, the story, is generally told to us through letters. 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 Simple or difficult? No. Simple. And it's a new mode of writing because when you write a novel, you just want to describe things. There's dialogue. You go here. You talk about stuff. But here, the major events are revealed to us through. Letters. So chapter one begins, somebody is described or somebody is talking and then says, oh, I received this letter from my brother. I wonder what is he writing to me. And she reads that and the whole chapter ends with, and then, uh, and, oh, I feel sorry for my brother. Maybe he's doing this. I want to write him a letter and etc. Even without being this mechanical like I am being right now. And the majority of the events would be revealed through it's funny because maybe some people did not like this. But 60 years later, 60 years later, this type of novels became what? Popular. You know why? Do you, can you guess? Can you guess why? Because men started writing. <laughs> One reason, 
But maybe people were not ready here for the novel, for the letters and epistolary novel. But later on, many things were done first by women, and they were not considered, they were neglected and ignored. When men wrote similar things, they were, hmm, impressive. So, this is Afra bin and love letters between a noble man and his, and his sister. Don't forget, always remember, critics have always been, almost always been men. 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 So whose opinion are we reading? Even this book is written by two men. But they're trying to be usually, uh, uh, this is a really very, very good book, but remember I told you you have to be careful about things, about colonialism, about whitewashing and stuff. Okay. Yes, please. In the book it says that uh, it, was, it became famous because it was at the top of the literary fashion. Say again. It says it was famous because it was at the top of the literary fashion. Okay, who made it at the top of the literary fashion? Men. Uh, male writers. Okay, Oronoko. This sounds like a, a strange name. Look at it, Oronoko. If your company is named Oronoko, it would be fun to play with the O's and the I's and the, the wheels. and It looks like a truck or something. Anyway, Oronoko, as the name suggests, an, an English name? No. No. An no. un-English name. This is a novel written in around in the late 17th uh, century by Afra Ben. This is one of the most significant early novels. It's actually a novella. I just said what novella is, I think. Short novel. Short novella. Short a big, short bigger novel. than short story. Short novel. I would say like 50, like even more, like 100 pages, 70 pages, 80 pages. It's a short novella. Yes. It's a long short story. Yes. Okay? Now, the story of Oronoko was inspired by a visit of Af by Afra Ben to one of England's colonies in Suriname in South America. There she met a black African slave. A black African slave. His name was Oronoko. He was moved, he was taken into, we know millions of yeah. Africans were Slaves. brutally taken. Many of them were killed, drowned. Where they were taken as slaves because America needed plantations, they needed the workers. Now, this is a very sad story because it tells a story of a man who was a prince in his own hometown. He was the king, the most important person. But see what colonialism is doing to him, to him destroying him. But this is not, when you read it, this is not only about feeling sad only for princes and queens and kings becoming slaves. It's about humanity as a whole. It's about, it's a protest. It's an angry protest against slavery in general. And this is probably one of the early literary works to discuss slavery and colonialism and the evils of colonialism. And who did this first? Afra Bin, a woman. Before men could do this, she did it first. She was critical. Some people would say, yeah, because generally a woman who was not happy with her society would try to protest anything. No. This is very condescending in a way or, or another. So Oronoko is originally an African prince who was brought in chains to work in Suriname, a British, uh, British colony. The novel, this is the most significant thing about the novel in many ways, other than the fact that it was written by a woman. It's a strong protest against, number one, slaves and slavery, and, and trade and slave, and a strong protest against colonialism, colonialism and imperialism. Colonialism and imperialism. imperialism, which shows that she's always proud of voicing her disagreement and protest against the society, the politics, and, and everything. Not many people did this at that time. Many people were happy to travel and become rich, to own country, to own people out 
outside. And like I said, according to Virginia Law says something really interesting about Afropian. She says, I can't remember this word for word, but she says, all the women in the world should put roses on Afropian's grave. Because she was one of the early women to speak up, to struggle for the rights of women, for the equal rights of women, to prove that women are as smart as men, if not smarter, if not more intellectual and more daring. You know daring? Yes, daring. Brave, daring. fearless. They are criticizing the whole system here of imperialism. Like John Donne, Afra Bin was considered outsider. an outsider. If John Donne was kicked because of his writing oh. against the current and because Break of rules. breaking the rules of the Quran, she was considered an outsider because of her right, she was in control of her because of her gender because she's a woman I'm sure if a man wrote this would have been received treated differently by literary critics please what did you want to ask uh, why she uh, was outsider an outsider why because she was controlled uh, at, at that time the society was controlled by society. okay that's this is a patriarchal society controlled by men. The rules are decided by men. The critics are men. The readers, the publishers men. probably men. are men. Because she was writing something critical of the society and, and imperialism. This is the interesting story of Afra Ben and Oronoko. You can read Oronoko, by the way, in one city. And maybe you can, I think you will find an audio book on YouTube. If you have time, you can download a PDF and you can Listen to them, we, where you can improve your listening skills and everything. Shayma. That could be it, yeah, part of it. No, not always. But she was criti like she in a way I'm saying here that she was neglected by critics, generally because she's a woman, and probably partly because she was critical of the society and life and imperialism and colonialism. We will see this. This is an interesting point you raise here, Shaima, because later on, we, remember when we speak about Dryden, John Dryden, remember, he was described as the greatest satirist of all time in a way. He was a great poet in writing satire, criticizing all people sometimes personally, attacking them personally. When women do this, like we have here with Mary Manley, Mary de la Rivere Manley. If you find it difficult, you just tell me Mary Manley. Now, Mary Manley was one of the greatest satirists in, the, in this age, in the Augustan age, the 18th century. But she didn't write satire in poetry, she, write, she wrote satire in? Prose. In novels. prose, in novels, in prose, in fiction. Where sometimes she would use real names, but mostly she would use fake, fake names just so people don't know that she's talking about them. Now when Dryden did this, the very same thing, he was praised, celebrated. When a woman did this, she was described as? Scandals. Scandals. You know scandal? Fadiha, yani. scandalous, fadaihiya, yani. like, oh, whoa, 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 wait, you're a woman, you shouldn't be writing about this, you shouldn't be doing this, this is a man's job, and this is the double standard we talk about all the time, when a man does something, oh, it's okay, he's a man, it's a local talk or something, but when a woman does it, whoa, wait a minute, why are you doing this, you shouldn't be talking about it, shh, but she was daring, she was strong, she was powerful, and I like that the fact that in the book, the authors here used the word scandalous in inverted commas. So telling us how men as critics reacted to her, but telling us at the same time we don't necessarily agree. So scandalous. And also some of her themes about women, about women, about, about for example, issues that the, the society did not want to speak about, such as rape, you know? You know rape? So who is generally the, the, generally the victim of rape? Women. Women. So no one wanted to write about rape. And she started including this issue, this theme in her books. And many people would view this as 
objectionable. You know objectionable? Controversial. What's controversial? Like, come on, you shouldn't be writing about this. This is disgusting. This is sick. Yeah, we, yeah, probably we have rape, but it's not this common like you're describing it. It's bad, but it's not as bad as you're talking about it. Because men are not generally victim of rape. It's only women. So her writing was very critical, sharp, critical satire of the politics, the religion, the church, the society, the community, men and everything. When Dryden did this, he was praised. He was praised. He was, praised. He was celebrated. When a woman did this, she was condemned and considered scandalous. Controversial. Is she controversial? She is controversial in a society controlled by men. But more or less. And it's funny because later on, like 30, 50 years later, men started to include these themes in their own writing. Were they considered objectionable? No. So that's, this is the double standard. This is the double, double standard. So Mary Manley, again, was a satirist. She, her satire was like Dryden, sharp and personal. But she was considered a scandalous by who? Madness. So in your exam, if I ask you, uh, Mary, Ma Mary uh, Manley was scandalous. True or false? False. false? false. She was a satirist. Why would you use the word satire to describe what man writes? And why would you describe as a scandal what a woman writes? Double standard. So she, what she wrote is satire. She exposes the weaknesses, the, the, the sins, the vices, vices of the society. Uh, so two uh, books, no, no details here, okay, uh, written by her two novels. Number one, The Secret History of Queen Zara, or Queen Zara, not sure of the, uh, the pronunciation. And The New Atlantis, which is again a political book that handled Many objectionable yes. themes such as rape. Ob objectionable to who? To men. Women. To the society, to the women, to the men, sorry. To the men of the society, right? And it's funny because when these themes were treated by men later on, they were not considered as objectionable. In brief, to conclude this class, Afra Ben and Mary Manley are the mothers of the English novel. Remember Chaucer? We sometimes father, describe yeah, the father. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you describe Shakespeare as the father of, I don't know, the English yeah. sonnet or the uh, drama or something. Uh, Dryden as the father of satire, I don't know. But it's funny, when there is a father, everyone is okay and happy. No one is looking for a mother. But when we have Afra Bin and Mary Manley as the mothers of the novels, the people who really started writing the novel, started the novel, everyone was look, looking for a father because of the double standards in the society. And indeed, Daniel Defoe, we'll discuss Daniel Defoe next class. Daniel Defoe is described as the father of the English novel, the first author to write an English novel. His novel is Robinson Crusoe, Robinson Crusoe written in 1719. We'll discuss this next class. Please, if you have any question uh, to ask. This, has, this is interesting. I want you to think of the things we said of yourselves, what you want to do in your life and the double standards, and how you can overcome these uh, double standards. Thank you.